Welcome everybody to our April 21st discussion group. This probably will be our final group on our abortion conversation. We'll see how it goes tonight, but we're going to start with Mark. He's going to open us with prayer. We thank you, loving God, for life, Father, Son, and Spirit, out of your life and love. Uh, you created, you created us, you created all that exists, all that we see, smell, hear, feel, touch. We thank you for that. We thank you for all, all that we experience of your goodness. We also know that, and you know, that we experience things that aren't so goodness. <laughs> um, evil and destruction and pain and suffering, but you're with us through it all. Uh, through every moment, through every challenge and obstacle, and you celebrate with us through every victory and every moment of growth and step along the journey. Uh, may we be that for and with each other as we uh, travel through life and its many uh, intricacies and complications. Um, but there's also so many wonderful and amazing things to be a part of. And this, this group is one of them. Uh, expand our horizons, our minds, and our acceptance and inclusion of those around us into your perfect being. And I pray for protection on those uh, who are in inclement weather, whether it be snow or cold mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, give us uh, strength, give us protection, and may we turn our eyes on you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, welcome to anybody that joined during the prayer. Oh, nice. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm not going to do all the reviewing that I've done before, because I think it's pretty much the same group that we've had in the past. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go back and watch parts one and two. And we had a prayer. And this might be our final week of the abortion conversation. Not that we couldn't go on for weeks and weeks. But really just thinking about the purpose of why we're discussing it, I think we can probably conclude tonight. And then next week we will be off because Mark and I will be out of town. So I want to start with um, why you're here. I never really asked that question. And it's easy to assume why people come to a discussion on abortion. Um, I will just say, while you're thinking, um, something I've wanted to talk about and study and look into myself. Um, that's why I'm personally here, because whenever you have to lead a group, you're always, uh, you, go, you dive into the deep end and listen to all sides and read and like stuff, you, you know, when you have a deadline, you just do more. <laughs> I think we all know that. It's just, um, it's like I've got stacks of books that I haven't touched, but when I'm up to lead lead or maybe like Sierra in school, write a paper, you have to dive into it and and then you become more well-versed in it. And so for me, I wanted to look at all different sides um, instead of just kind of looking at the side I always thought I was in and and just hear stories and, and think about things uh, differently or just expand my mind. So that, that's why I'm here, to be educated and to have compassion for all sides of the spectrum and make sure that I have actual facts um, backing up my opinion and my views. Um, so I will open the floor if anybody wants to share why you're here, why you chose to uh, be part of this conversation, why you chose some people, as you noticed, decided not to be a part of this and it could be scheduling but maybe they just here i'll take this off for a minute um carol i would love to hear why you're here well um 
<clears throat> I've been doing the 40 days of prayer, 40 days for life. Uh, for my every day, I'm on about, I think, 35 or six now, uh, the days, and it just has been really weighty on me, the huge number of hundreds of thousands of lives taken all over the world since Roe v. Wade, and it just, it's just terrible, it's just a terrible, terrible thing, and I wanted to know more about it, to understand more about it, and try to hear the other side of the story. I said, I have not ever been in that situation. I really don't know how I would have reacted years ago if I had ever been faced with that. I would hope that I would make the right decision. I think I would, but uh, I feel for those people that do have to make that decision. And I just don't feel like that I'm in a position to judge them at all if they made what I would consider the wrong decision. For them, it was the right one, I suppose. I don't know about that, but I just really wanted to learn more about it. Uh, perhaps I'll be able to help someone sometime. <laughs> if I have the information and am able to, if someone ever comes to me, with that problem, I would hope that I'd be able to direct them like Joan has learned to do. I've learned a lot from you, Joan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I, what I, I love, one thing I love about you is just that you are a learner and you are humble and teachable. And that's beautiful. That's the spirit that I want to have as well. So I'm glad you're here. Anybody else want to share why you're here? I know it's kind of strange to ask it on the final day, but David, Dave, we see David's face. This is the black box we usually know as David. <laughs> usually I'm like laying down and like just <laughs> soaking it all in. Um, yeah. So as, as I said before, like the real reason I'm here is because it's a corner something and I'm here for it. Um, but for this topic in particular, um, uh, I don't know, it's kind of, I kind of struggle finding the words because uh, for just to be like completely honest, like most of the discussion so far has been like so far away from where I, where I am that I don't know what to contribute to it. Um, but then I think, I think the probably the easiest way to explain is just that like the people that I have met in my life uh, I like I, I have gotten different perspectives from them and like two that come to mind. Uh, I mean, most of you probably know who these people are, but I'll leave them nameless. Um, I know one person who um, had a child and lost lost it in a pretty, pretty traumatic way. <clears throat> and just like hearing, um, is there any here like talk about what it was like for her to go through that? just kind of opened me up to like so many things that I have never even considered. And the other one that I think about is, uh, I know a kid who um, grew up with a mom that was like abusive to him and hearing him describe that experience, like kind of tackled like the same issue of like, have like complicated traumatic relationships between a mother and a child. Um, and like stuff like that has like made me like slow down so much and like really consider uh, uh, cause like there's this, this assumption that I feel uh, like everyone I ever talked to who is on the pro-life side, it's the assumption that it is obviously and completely totally correct that we should, we should want the number of abortions to be as low as humanly possible. And like, I don't know whether or not I agree with that, um, but, I, but I definitely feel like we focus so much on that question and like so much that it, I feel like it ignores like all of these other things that I would call pro-life. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's just kind of my thoughts on it um, that like, I don't know, it, it feels like such a big issue to me, but I just so often don't even know where to start talking about it. Yeah. So yeah, and then 
I guess really the main thing why I'm here is, is just to like listen to people. Like I'm a guy, so I literally will never have to decide whether to get an abortion for myself. So honestly, I, I just like hearing women's voices for, for this conversation. So yeah, that, that's why I'm here. Thank you, David. I was gonna say it's nice to have, to hear the men's perspective too. Yeah. So I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're here to listen and and learn and bring another voice to the table <coughs> and think about it in a different way. Because I know you are widely read and yes. Okay, happy birthday, Anne. You're up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting that as uh, you. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows. Um, I am here. Um, over the past few years, the, uh, this topic has become a uh, some uh, something that immediately like sparks emotion for me, um, and let me start here. I I'm an early childhood educator, and so my life, my career, and all of my education surrounds children and how they develop and what's best for them, their behavior, psychology, all of that. Um, and so I have a profound reverence for the life of a child and also what it takes to parent a child. Um, and I, because of that, I have a strong belief that entering into parenthood, particularly motherhood, should be something that a, that a person is completely, uh, should be something that the person completely chooses and enters into with all of their capacities and, and um, something that, um, should be methodically um, stepped into um, because that's that is what's best for a child um, and I And so it's it's from that that um, posture of reverence that I have for raising a child and and bringing a child in, into the world that I am uh, strongly pro-choice, um, all the way from you know choosing your partner, choosing um, when to uh, when to start having sex, choosing um, birth control, choosing, like, everything that goes into, um, um, reproduction and, and all of that, so my hope is that, so in my, um, conclusion of pro-choice, I also want the number of abortions to be, you know, zero, because having an abortion just means that that woman did not get to choose to be pregnant. They didn't want to be pregnant. Somehow it happened. They weren't prepared for it. Um, and so I, I want to create a world in where women don't have to get to that point uh, where they have to choose um, how, to, how to handle it at that point. Um, but here we are. Here's the world we, we live in, where where women or a lot of women don't have opportunities to make sound choices about their bodies, um, uh, deciding about birth control, um, understanding um, uh, uh, how to make choices about you know the the partners that they commit to. Or, or even just the financial freedom. Like even if someone wants to 
is okay with being a single mom, the the society that we've created does not support single mothers very well. So they're, with the wage gap and not having as many resources as they would if they they had um, a, a male spouse. Um, it, it's just all of these different things contribute to the the world we've created where women have to make such a hard decision um, that is truly agonizing and and traumatizing um, while you're going through the decision process and post decision whatever you choose um, whether a woman chooses to give birth and keep the child, give birth and uh, give it up for adoption or abort or whatever, there's going to be therapy needed because um, the world does not support women and mothers very well. So those, those are the reasons why I'm here. Just because it's a thing. For me. I just have one question. What's Patrick doing in the background? Oh, uh, he's making he's making my lunch for tomorrow. <laughs> oh well, keep it up, Patrick. <laughs> Good yeah. job, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is that so? I muted everybody. I'm, I'm like, being no. domestic. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Good job, Patrick. <laughs> he is supporting this woman. <laughs> Woo! Um, oh, and you're you you have also been proud because he's fr he's lightly breading and frying tofu. Ooh! Yeah. I'm yeah. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I love breaded mm -hmm. tofu. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was very well said and appreciate your voice in this conversation. All right. Anybody? Oh, David says save him some tofu, Patrick. Okay. Um, anybody else want to share why you're here? Even if I can't see your face or if I can. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, Mark. Oh, um, because I'm unemployed. <laughs> and I'm not working on Wednesday nights, and my oh wife is hosting a discussion group on abortion. So I have wow. to be here. <laughs> Wow. No, no, no. <laughs> um, this, it is so good, even in, th even in things that we want to shy away from or think it's too complicated to understand, to be able to either dip our toes into it or to jump into the deep end. I'm a big proponent of learning and hearing somebody else's story uh, and, and, and growing from that. There's so much going on in the world and there's so much divisiveness because we haven't stopped to listen. And it's not that I can even understand, like David said, I can't understand what it would be like to make a choice like, like this. Um, but I, I want to... I want to be educated and I want to learn. I want to be informed. And because it is such a politically hot topic, I want to know the history of the movements of, of, of not just abortion, but, but a lot of different things. And the, the, um, the progression of different movements, of different ideologies, of different philosophies. Um, I like philosophy and ethics. And to, to dig deep into, into all of that, to me, it's, it's fascinating. But, but I guess bottom line is it is about life and choice. So I want, I want to be a part of the discussion um, so that my compassion level, but also my intellectual understanding can meet the challenges ahead. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Lonnie is clapping for you. Oh. Or, she's <laughs> or are you her raising your hand? To... <clears throat> People use that. Are you raising your hand, Lonnie? I am. Oh, yay. Um, I know I missed the last, the last um, mm -hmm. gathering conversation. Um, I was, I've always been really curious about the male or the father's perspective when um, and I'm uh, from uh, uh, unwed, an unwed, uh, un unwed mother to be. Um, I've always been curious and never had anyone to ask what the father's feelings were, except when I would talk to 
well, a couple friends, um, um, that a, a couple people I know did have abortions. And um, when I asked, well, how does he feel about this? Their response was, they said for me to just handle it. However, I felt, you know, best to do it. And so the, the girls, and they were girls, they, uh, one was only 17 and one was 20, she, not quite 21. And um, they, they didn't, neither one of them were using birth control. And, um, but were very active in their, you know, sexual activities. And from their, from what they were saying, it sounded like the, the guys were just completely absent, that they just didn't feel any responsibility to the situation or contributing to, um, you know, the, the future of, of, a, of a baby. And I know the, the, the one girl said she didn't even tell him because she didn't, uh, he, he, she knew he didn't want any children. And so she got an abortion so she could stay with him. So I was, you know, I didn't know how many guys would be in this on, on these Wednesday uh, meetings and I didn't know how many would even speak up, but I, I just, it just seems like, you know, the women, um, the girls, the girls are in it alone. You know, the, it, now I'm not saying every guy abandons the girl when, when she comes to him and says, you know, um, but a lot of girls, I think, find themselves completely alone dealing with the problem because now the guy is gone and he, he got what he wanted and now he's absent. And, and that's a tremendous amount, just being in that situation <clears throat> to put on a young girl, but then to have to even consider that decision, to, to even think that that was an option. Um, anyways, I, so, so I came, cause, I mean, I logged in because I wanted to hear, um, I wanted to hear how other people might have felt about that and, and, and how much thought had been given to, to the fact that these guys leave these girls and don't they have any remorse or don't they feel any level of responsibility to the girl and to the, to the unborn child? I, so anyway, that's why I was here. I wanted to hear what other people what other people's experiences have been, maybe not from a personal experience, but you know, maybe they, maybe people know other people who have shared with them uh, going through this experience. So I wanted to, I wanted to hear because I've always felt really bad. My those two people, I always felt really bad for both of them. Um, yeah, it was really a sad situation, and I just. Anyway, so that's why I'm here. I, I, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Lonnie. That's a, um, yeah, that's a, a great, it's something I hadn't put in any of the slides or anything to talk about, but, um, but we have talked a little bit about the support of the female. We will talk about that tonight. And so if anybody has a story or, or a thought on that, especially our our males on the on the call. Um, yeah, Carol, I muted you, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, I wasn't sure where that noise was coming from, then I realized it was Patrick. <laughs> I was muting everybody. <laughs> I have had experience with a, a woman years and years ago uh, who was pregnant and was not married. Her, and uh, 
they were just delighted. He was delighted they were having the baby. She was delighted they were going to have the baby. And then they got in some sort of an argument and she went out and had an abortion without even telling him that she was going to. Revenge. It was just, <laughs> and, uh, and they split up and she married a couple of times after that. And he married a couple of times after that. All these years later, 40 years later, they're back together again. <laughs> it was amazing. Wow. And he, both of them just so regret that they didn't have that baby. Wow. And especially her, she said, I just, I did it in just a, without even thinking about it. If he doesn't care about me, I don't want to have this baby. And she just yeah. went out and had an abortion just with no thought or, about it at all. I, well, he probably would have talked her out of it if he had been there, right. you know, been together. But that's one I know that just really, really regretted it. Thank you, Carol. Anybody else want to share why you're here? Before I, I go to our slides real quick. Oh. Hi. Hey, somebody's putting their closet together. Nice. Closet, <laughs> desk, the house yeah. in general. <laughs> did you um, want to share? I did. I'm laughing. Sorry, I'm just laughing at your knee. No, it's okay. your... Yeah, it's uh, climbing weird. over your I bed. I have to do a lot of gymnastics to uh, just get to my bed. Okay. Um, so I know I am here. So I'm here because my mom didn't get an abortion. Right. I was born out of wedlock. My uh, mom and dad contemplated it. Um, they didn't end up getting an abortion. That's why I'm here. Um, it's, I think my mom got pregnant within like six months of my mom and my dad dating. Um, and then my, my grandma and my grandpa was like, nope, you're keeping the baby and you're getting married next month. We're going to call the church. We're going to set it up. We're going to, we're going to get all this together. And cause they believe my, 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 my grandfather, he, he believes that, um, you know, once you have a baby with someone, you should get married. Now, that is very traditional, kind of old school way of thinking about it. Um, and that can lead to a lot of issues in terms of abuse and, and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just grateful that it, it really wasn't that much of an issue in my family. But I know it can be, right? As far as my perspective, Alani, just to share, um, it's, I, I don't know too much about um, about the abortion statistics and the rates and what actually goes through with it. I've kind of avoided the topic for the most part. Um, and I guess that just further proves your point about how men care less about it, right? Um, it's not something that I've had to deal with. It's not something that I've encountered with my friends. And so I can't really speak too much about it because um, it's not something that anyone I know, right? Anyone I know has, has gone through that. So um, yeah, I mean, just, just to give you that uh, male perspective, that's uh, I'm here because my mom didn't get an abortion. And I, I guess where I'm at right now is it's up to the woman, you know? Um, I'm not pro-choice or pro-life. Um, I just think it's more complicated than, I, I just think it's more complicated than we make it out to be sometimes. And these conversations are really important. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting your camera and mic and speaking from the male perspective and answering Lonnie's question. and. Um, I think you are 100% right that it's uh, more nuanced than um, a very black and white legalistic reduced uh, reductionism, whatever, uh, where you can just say 100% of the time, this is the wrong thing to do and the right thing to do. I think that that, that, that there's there's more nuance than that. And and there is, um, and we'll, we'll get into that in the slides. I won't steal from that. Stanley, did you want to say something? 
Uh, yes, I was curious, what was the position of the Worldwide Church of God or even the Radio Church of God back in the 50s? <laughs> because I remember something about that they didn't believe that the soul was there until the first breath. There is that, that theory. If the person is not breathing, of course, it's getting oxygen through the mother. So, But uh, there was that, that idea, the concept that the first breath is when the soul, as it were, the, 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 the creature becomes a living soul, as it were, the first breath. And uh, that would affect abortion, of course, but I just wondered what do you know? I don't, I don't remember the position. Do you? Mm, no, I, I don't. Um, especially not having been around at that time. <laughs> but well, having, it, it would change, it would have changed gradually, but yeah, yeah but, but having been, <clears throat> having been a part of the, the church for so long and, and working where I have uh, with them for, for, for decades. Um, my guess is because what you said, Stanley, was, I, I think, a a typical stance of an evangelical or a, a Christian at that time in the 50s and 60s, the idea of when life began based on, I think, Genesis 2-7, that a lot, of, a lot of people thought life began at birth or that first, um, that first breath. Uh, like I mentioned last week, um, back in the early 1900s, maybe even late 1800s, uh, they would be slow in doing an abortion after what they call the quickening, which is when they would first feel the, the movement or kicking or movement of the child. Um, so, so again, that, that idea of when life begins has evolved, if I can use that word, over time. And so my guess is the stance would have been um, fairly much the same in the Worldwide Church of God. And I would imagine if you were to say pro-life or pro-choice, the church most likely would have been pro-life. Um, yeah. Carol. It, it, Carol was around. It, 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 I was, just I was on when around then. Started. She was actually yeah. around then. You want to speak yeah, to I that, Carol? I was around then, and uh, if it wasn't mentioned in the Bible, yeah. they, they wouldn't address anything <laughs> if it wasn't mentioned True. in the Bible. True. And uh, But I do remember that about the breath. Uh, he, when God breathed life into Adam and Eve, they became a soul, a living soul. And they, they believe that, but they were not anti-contraception. Uh, right. like that was okay. Yeah. We were relieved. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, I, yeah. I will say from a man's perspective, I have to apologize to not just the women on the call or in the, on the Zoom, but to all women because men have been able to have their cake and eat it too. They can be in a patriarchal, powerful, uh, domineering position to, to, to have the woman submit to their authority to get an abortion or not get an abortion. To get them pregnant. To get them pregnant, right? The power, <laughs> the, the, the shame, and all, all, all of that that goes with it. Um, and then on the other side of it, just run away when there's responsibility to be had. And, and it is absolutely a, a, a scourge on humanity, the way males have been and treated women and others, especially um, white males, and not just their subjugation of women, but of other races and ethnicities as well. Um, so we... Um, we have, a, we have a lot to make up for, let me tell you. But white males haven't oppressed women any more than other races, I don't think. I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that to, yeah. to an extent. Um, China, China and uh, places in Africa. and also, I don't think it's a, Globally, a Caucasian right. thing. It's a human thing. No, but we're really good at it, yeah. Um, in this country, I, should, I guess I should, yeah. should say in this country, um, the white male is is definitely most dominant. Well, just because they've been in power. Yeah, because I mean. we've been in power for, for, for so long. Making the rules and the laws, you know, Congress and Senate for, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s made up of mostly old, older white males and making all the rules and the laws. And we've, we've suffered for it in so many ways as a country. 
but that's my perspective. Another thing that's going to talk about the complexity. Uh, I've been reading recently that they have an artificial womb that they had sheep grow for four months and develop for four months. And uh, if they develop an artificial womb for humans, that might change the equation too. Yeah. Got that right. <laughs> that would definitely change the equation. I do want to, um, I do want to, Carol had mentioned the number of deaths, deaths since Roe v. Wade, and it's hard to find statistics before RV, uh, Roe v. Wade. Abortions were happening. Because abortions were illegal, and so the statistics are a little bit harder to come by. They were just illegal, so they weren't recording them. But I, I just did some reading just a second ago, and again, it's 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 a range, but anywhere from 200,000 to 1.2 million abortions a year. And then in the 60s and 70s, a study was, was done looking at the 60s and 70s before Roe v. Wade, and their extrapolations are as many as 859,000 abortions uh, before Roe v. Wade, and we all know it's much less now than, than that. Um, and of course, the mortality rate of women who got abortions, especially mm -hmm. illegally, um, the mortality rate of women was, was Close to 20 percent much, much higher. Yeah. yeah. 20, 25 percent. Um, so it's it's a. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So. Let me just go through these real quick, unless somebody else wanted to share. I don't know if everybody had a chance to say why they were here that wanted to, not required. Um, I, what I'm gonna do, okay, so putting this together was not easy, but I thought what I would do is just put a couple points under each one about, about the positions that we're talking about so that we all would be able to try to just for a moment, put ourselves in that position and, and have, let's see, give the other side the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to do what they believe is right. Even though we may, we may not agree with it, um, to just have that empathy for the other, for the other. So I'm gonna go through each one and then um, we can talk about maybe where we can what we do agree on and where we go from here. So, um, so for the first, the first position is the pro preborn life and pro criminalization position. Um, so I'm just gonna whip through these really fast. So this position believes that the Bible is clear that life begins in the womb. And there's a couple scriptures that they use. The word abortion is never used in the Bible. Um, there are some principles, obviously. Jeremiah 1 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And then in Psalm 139, 13 through 16, most of you know this one that uh, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So, uh, and then there's one more in Exodus 21 22, which is, of course, um, a law for the Israelites. And there were, they, they, these laws got into the nitty gritty of their lives. And this one had to do with people fighting and hitting a pregnant woman and her giving birth prematurely. Um, and then what to do about that. And, and commentaries say that really there, this could be speaking to miscarriage. Like, like if you got into a fight, hit a pregnant woman, she miscarried and what you're supposed to do. Um, and, or if she was killed or she was injured, the mother, the mother um, how to, how to um, handle that in, in legally. So those are the only, and then of course, of course, we'll get into the murder, uh, the, ten, the Ten Commandments, of course, that's one that is used as well. So um, in this position, um, they believe that science shows that life begins at conception. And um, this is just one uh, doctor who is quoted a lot. And she talks about the, the reason she believes that, that life begins at birth is because the two cells come together and create something new. It's not like two liver cells coming together or two skin cells. It's it, when they come together, they actually create a new type of cell called a zygote and that's a, or a one cell embryo. So that, that's why this, um, this scientist believes that life begins at conception. 
Um, another position, uh, another belief in this position is that our lives are not our own, that they belong to God and we're just the stewards. And so it's really not our right to decide to end a life or a soul or a potential life. And the, the scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 is used, you're not your own, you're bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Um, another stance is that, um, of course, abortion is murder, so therefore it's a sin, and but it's not an unforgivable sin. Um, I believe that abortion is murder, that it is a sin, and that it should be legally treated as such, illegal and criminal. So that, that's, and obviously when, within this position, there might be people who have variations of each one of these beliefs. Um, there's also a belief that studies show it is almost never medically necessary to abort a baby to save a mother's life. Uh, some material there you can read by, in, of course. In, in modern times. Modern times. We're talking about modern times. Yeah, like right now, today. We're not talking about before we had all these medical interventions. I think a baby can live now at two pounds um, so or even less. So there's just some stuff. Um, another belief is that 3% of abortions are due to rape and incest. Uh, and 97% are to avoid the inconvenience or hardship of having a child. Th so this is a statistic that, that I has thrown out there a lot that it's, it's just... Um, to avoid inconvenience, or perhaps if they got news that their baby was going to be deformed or disabled in some form. Um, and adoption, although not easy, is the better option over abortion. So this would typically be not just religious people, but typically your religious uh, conservatives are in this camp. Um, the second column is very much like the first column, but they believe in other variations of law and criminalization. In other words, d not criminalizing the mother, but maybe only prosecuting the doctors or legalizing abortion, but increasing other alternatives. Um, but very much similar, just a variation on how you prosecute or legalize or manage. The third column over is um, agreeing with much of column one, but advocating more equally for the welfare of both the mother and the unborn, um, believing the mother should have a choice. It shouldn't be illegal for them, or it shouldn't, abortion should be on the table as an option, but they shouldn't take place after viability, which would be late term abortions in the, in the third trimester, um, when a baby can live on its own outside the mother's body. And obviously no baby can live on their own. I don't mean they can feed themselves and walk around and take care of themselves. You know what I mean, like they can breathe, and yeah, and then the fourth column is a little bit um, more lengthy, and obviously there's variations. And if you disagree with something I put on this chart, please feel free to let me know because obviously this is just the way I'm uh, categorizing the information. So um, advocates first for the welfare, well-being, and whole person health care for the mother, which usually includes access to most forms of family planning. So. Um, should, mother should be in there somewhere on that. Stands up against patriarchal control over the systems that oppress and harm women and support the moral right for a woman to be able to decide what happens to her body. And I'll just say in all the different interviews and articles I read, this is huge. This is a big thing where women have been oppressed in their bodies. Like men have used women's bodies for their own pleasure, gotten them pregnant, and then told them what they can do with their pregnancy and their body. And, and so I feel like a lot of the, the pro-choice, um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a pushback. It's like, you know, get the heck out of Dodge. I get to decide what I do with my body. Um, and, you know, part of that is because, um, as Mark was saying, the, the men that have been in power have not used their power well. And I don't know that women in power would use their power any better. But it just, it's just the way that, that things are, that men in power tend to be a bit more, um, uh, what's the word? They, they, abu they abuse more <laughs> and um, take advantage more. They're more powerful. I mean, just physically more powerful. So this is a big part of pro-choice. And I just want you to hear, I just want you to hear this. Not all women are running around sleeping with everybody they can and trying to have abortions as a form of birth control. I think that's an unfair picture 
that is painted by conservatives to say that. Um, so that's why I'm, I, I think it's good for us to just look at all the, the, the range. So generally, um, from what I could tell, a lot of pro-choice um, people in the pro-choice movement do not necessarily be that sentient life begins at conception. It's sure the cell is different. It's a zygote instead of a sperm and an egg, but um, you know, at least up until the first trimester, which is when most abortions happen up to the end of that first trimester, there's not a lot of heavy conscious, like, oh, I murdered a baby. It's like, it's, it's seen in a different light than, than um, murder, I should say. So, and, and the very, such a small portion of pregnancies are terminated in the late term. So to see whenever we talk about abortion, to throw up a picture of a partial birth, birth abortion is pretty, pretty unfair because that's a very small, it's a small portion of women that actually, and a lot of times, from what I can tell, it has, the doctors are the ones that are telling the mother, like this one gentleman, I listened to his story, um, they, he and his wife were excited about having the baby, they were in the third term, and the doctors said that there was something very medically wrong and the baby was going to die as soon as the baby was born, and they really recommended getting a late-term abortion. Um, they did not believe that was the ethical thing to do. So they carried through with it. And then a couple months after they gave birth, he sat and held his baby as she bled from every orifice that blood would come out of. And he, he said it was just horrible. And that had he to do it over again, he probably would have gone with the late term abortion because of the trauma that it caused he and his wife to have to watch their baby die like that. So I know that's a rare thing and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be uh, gratuitous, but um, just to say, I think what I want you to hear is that it's not black and white, okay? Because I, I think if Jesus were here, he wouldn't be campaigning in either camp. He would be going to each individual and ministering to each individual. There's a woman wrapped around every baby, you know what I mean? So it's like he would care for the whole package. And I, I think Patrick spoke to this last week about how we reduce it down to this black and white decision and we forget that there's a whole package uh, around it of, of poverty and abuse and, um, you know, the ability of a woman to care for. And I'm not saying that we take this casually. Please do not hear me say that at all. Because I, I do believe that, that the baby can feel pain and hear things and, and, and can be born from a very, very, you know, um, small size inside the mother's womb. Um, I do believe that they are a sentient being at some point, but um, I, I think that I think that instead of sitting in judgment of of another person's decision, we need to climb into it and, and come alongside them and help them to navigate through it. So, um, in the pro-choice movement, there's they advocate for compassion and equality, but may believe that the rights of the woman have a greater weight than the rights of a fetus especially one that cannot survive outside the mother's womb. Um, and there's also the belief that a moral position against abortion by some of the population should not block access for the rest of the population. Um, it's definitely um, in this column, they're anti-criminalizing or making it illegal um, completely. Um, belief that abortions have always taken place since the beginning of time and making them illegal will not reduce them, but will actually make it more dangerous for women. Um, Pro-life says abortion is wrong, pro-choice says abortion is, period. Making abortion illegal won't stop them from happening, it will only stop them from being safe. And Mark kind of spoke to that. So um, I probably could have added a lot more to that, but that's kind of an overview of the four columns. And you might be you might know exactly where you stand or you might be still trying to decide. Um, I think what I'd like to talk about in our remaining time, maybe just go a couple minutes over, is just how can we become advocates for women and babies, both where we agree. Um, I'm just going to throw a couple charts up here. Mark pulled these up for me. The U.S. abortion rate in 2014 was recorded 
at the lowest point it had been since 73 Roe v. Wade. Lower 2017. And yeah, I think I've got 2017 is even lower. Yeah. And what's interesting, and you know, one of the things we can do is is vote. And obviously, you know, we can talk about politics at some other point. But I thought I'd show you this chart, which is, you know, obviously red and blue. Um, abortion, abortion did not go away under Trump. It, it just didn't. Or Republicans. Or, or Republicans, or or under Bush, or you know, it just. Or, or Reagan. So I don't. So I just just be informed. All I can say is be informed when you vote. Um, and, and know what part you can play in being an advocate for women and babies, both. Um, so where do we agree? How can we go forward? How can we be advocates? What would Jesus do? Those are all the questions I want to just kind of open the floor to, um, for us to speak to in our remaining time. And if you think that we're, we'll just open the floor and then we'll decide whether or not we're done with discussing this. Anybody want to say anything about any of the charts or um, if you want copies of anything I've shown you, please let me know. I'll send them to you. Carol, go ahead. I am kind of a libertarian. I think the less the government has to do with private matters, the better. And uh, I don't, I don't think it should be a political question. I think the individual has a right to their choice, regardless of government. I don't think they should be passing laws on things like that. And like I said, God gives us the choice, but he tells us what to choose. And we can, we have free will, we can choose it or not choose it. I think that, well, my personal opinion is he gives us a choice, life or death, but he says, choose life. That's just my personal belief, uh, but I don't think it should be a political matter. But I do think the baby should have rights. Thank you, Carol. Okay, um, Lonnie and then Joan. Go ahead, Lonnie. Um, on your chart, it showed a decrease in 2017. What do they attribute the decrease to? Is there more birth control available or women um, getting, uh, being more, um, 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 taking, you know, taking more charge of their life. Are they, are they like establishing their own careers? And so they're using birth control to, to manage that. So they don't have any unwanted pregnancies. I mean, do you have any data on why yeah. it declined? I don't know if you saw any mark when you were looking at uh, when you got those charts, but that's usually the reason for declination is uh, better health care um, and uh, sex education availability to contraceptives. Um, so health care, especially in um, in, the, in the late or in the in the mid to, to later two thousands. Um, the rates went down. I did see it wasn't on the chart, but I did see that in 2018 abortions went up by one or two percent. Um, but but yeah, that's usually that's usually the reason. Almost any time there's a decline, it's be, it's because of healthcare availability be, and it could, yeah availability access. And it's a and, good question. Yeah, and and poverty issues too as well um, play a role. Do you think then that? Planned Parenthood was providing, or, or were they providing um, contraceptives and stuff like that? I mean, did women go to Planned Parenthood for oh, that? Oh, certainly, kind of yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there okay. were, I know that a lot of them were defunded um, in the last administration, so I don't know if that has any effect of the statistics on that graph or not. Um, so it's complex. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if it has effect on the graph it could you know <clears throat> Planned Parenthood is is definitely a uh, um, oh what's the word for it uh, a powder keg in, in a sense uh, people are really for it or really against it yeah uh, Planned Parenthood has a a perceived tradition of, of not offering 
too many options to, to women as far as um, actually um, saving the child or putting up for adoption. Um, but they also do offer a lot of healthcare and contraceptive availability. Um, I do know, um, and I don't know if this was for, the, for, for all of the four years of the Trump administration compared to the last four years of Obama, but even with uh, President Trump closing or defunding, defunding some um, Planned Parenthood, uh, Planned Parenthood still received uh, $500 million more in that year or in his administration than under Obama uh, because <laughs> states stepped up and gave Planned Parenthood money that the government did not give them. So they actually had more uh, funding <laughs> under the Trump administration than under Obama. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, it's really tough, tough, <laughs> tough to, 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 to see what's best for the whole thing. Um, well, I guess I, I just mentioned Planned Parenthood because I wasn't thinking of healthcare, like um, healthcare plans. Right. Um, if, if, if a woman found herself pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy and was she in a position to even have insurance so she could go to a private doctor and, you know, get, mm -hmm. I, I, I just, first thing I thought of was Planned Parenthood or for like underrepresented or underprivileged um, girls and women, what are their, like, what were their health care options and, and Planned Parenthood just popped in my head. Yeah, but, and, and, and I'm sure Joan has um, experience or at least stories or um, maybe some information. something to share about, about Planned Parenthood and some of their um, uh, processes um, versus um, pregnancy care clinics and, and, and other Healthcare. Yeah, crisis clinics. Yeah, Joan, you're, you're up next. Well, my first question to Mark is, do they include chemical abortions in those statistics, or do you know? It, it didn't reference the kind of abortion. Because right now they're trying to offer chemical abortion pills by, may, or by telemedicine. The doc, a doctor does not have to see a woman. They don't have mm -hmm. to know if she's really pregnant, but if she can call up and, and get the pills. So, and there can be bad side effects to that. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah. Uh, along with any kind of yeah. pharmaceutical. Is that through Planned Parenthood or just um, uh, yeah, probably doctors? I, I think it's through Planned Parenthood. They're trying to, I don't know what the status is of that, but um, I just also had a question about what about underage girls, should they be able to get an abortion without notifying their parents? And that's, uh, you know. I know that's been, um, and that is decided state by state, I believe. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a topic in all, uh, uh, on its own. Uh, as far as Planned Parenthood, has anyone seen the movie Unplanned? Um, no, Abby Johnson was director of Planned Parenthood in um, Texas, uh, College Station, yeah. the central part of Texas, and for eight years. And um, she left Planned Parenthood. During that time, she was the director, but had not been involved in the abortions. The doctors would come in and do them, but she was asked to um, assist in an abortion, and she had to uh, do the ultrasound while the doctor was doing the abortion. Wow. And that's what made her uh, change her mind. She had already had a medical abortion and a chemical abortion in her life. So she left Planned Parenthood. They sued her. They lost. She won the lawsuit, but Planned Parenthood sued her for leaving and for just telling what she had experienced. And she wrote a book about it. And there's a movie that came out um, a couple of years ago. So Un Unplanned. Unplanned yeah. is what it's called. Um, Margaret Sanger is the one who founded Planned Parenthood and mm -hmm. she was a eugenics uh, person. She, in fact, Hitler got some of his ideas from her uh, that he used in 
persecuting the Jews and trying to exterminate them. So there's that history for Planned Parenthood. Uh, one thing Abby Johnson was told before she, when she finally left Planned Parenthood was that abortion was their main concern and she was told she had to do a certain number of abortions and they had to increase every month. And so that's kind of a little bit of the background. Mm -hmm. um, like so many things, it becomes about the money and the numbers and not about yeah. the people. Yeah. And uh, been, Carol, ha Carol has a question. Women have gone okay. there and they, they don't offer adoption option or parenting option. They usually agree and say, yes, you need to have an abortion right. because that's their focus. Yeah. So yeah. that's where I, I don't blame any of the women for what they face or what they go through. I just feel that a lot of them are being deceived and not being given all yeah. the choices. They, if they say pro-choice, but why not give them all the choices? And uh, so that's what- Carol, did you have a question for my mom? Yeah. Uh, no, I had something to add to that. Uh, in this 40 days uh, for live, the 40 days of prayer, I get, uh, every month I get a lot of literature and they've taken polls of women leaving uh, Planned Parenthood and asked them, did they give, give you adoption information? Did you, they give you other options? And, and just 90% of them said no. All they said was set you up for an, to have an abortion. We'll set you up with a appointment to have your abortion. And they do not give both sides of it and everything I've read. And especially the polls are just uh, amazing. So and I, if they don't get the abortion, it, the price goes up the longer they delay it. If they yeah. put off a week or two, the price keeps going up. So they don't do them for free. They, you know. It's a money-making thing. And then the whole scandal about selling selling uh, stem cells and sell baby body parts and all that stuff is just horrifying. We got that's we got that's all. Thing. Okay, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. <laughs> it was, <laughs> Thank you for the two cents. More valuable than two cents for sure. Yep. Um, so where where do we agree? Like, where would you say all of the viewpoints agree, and what? How can we move forward? Maybe in unison to. Well, maybe it's not in unison. Maybe, maybe the the agreement is just to find what column you're in and advocate for the health and welfare of women and children in that column. You know, if you're pro-choice, to do it in the best way possible. Um, if you're pro-life, to do that in the best way possible. That that honors. Um, I think I think the goal is life is precious. We want to see, as Sierra said in her opening statement, um, we'd love to see a world where women had choices and they they were in a place, a healthy place, where they got to choose. You know, they were just in, they could choose their mate and and when they want to get pregnant and and not have to face the abortion issue. Um, but I, I I think abortions have been around from what I can tell for probably since the beginning of time. I mean, midwives were the ones who did abortions before it became a medical thing. And um, they we... still teach, it's a big movement now. It's called, it's called body sovereignty and midwives teach women how to do self-abortion. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it that are natural and, you know, for, and they, you know, do it as a form of <laughs> even being healthier than being on the pill because the pill changes your hormones and, and can be detrimental. So, um, Sierra, did you have your hand up? Um, at, least, at least the way I see it, I, I think all uh, all the stances can agree that, like, can agree abortion is bad. Um, like, we, no one's hoping for an abortion. No one's hoping right. to have to um, yeah. make that choice. I think just where where it all differs is um, uh, how, how to live that out. Um, and to, to the question before, um, the, the, 
the decline in certain years, I think it was like cumulative, like it, it was like progress feeding off of each other from like different, um, different new policies and things like that kind of mm -hmm. creating more opportunities for when, and, uh, uh, for example, like um, women being able to open up their own bank account. So having more financial um, independence uh, back in the eighties and, um, and more access to childcare. Um, mm -hmm. And like, so certain decisions like that create environments where women, um, uh, women who find out they're pregnant can have a little bit more optimism when thinking about um, having a child. Um, so as those things start to accumulate, there's like a steady decline that kind of just builds off of each other. Um, and another thing is, um, uh, what was I going to say? Blah, 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 blah. It's a good point, though. Um, Even there's just stigma. Uh, oh yeah, there's. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's um, there's talks, talks and research and things like that, like trying uh, rapidly occurring right now, trying trying to predict. Um, how the pandemic will affect um, parenthood, motherhood, um, uh, because as, you know, things shut down and more women during this pandemic have had to make that choice between devoting their time to their children or going to work. And so they've had to make compromises here and there. Um, um, and so there's a huge, um, there's like a vacuum of, of women in the workforce um, and things like that. And how that's going to play out over the next, you know, 10 years, um, it, it, how, how long it will take to recover, um, how long will it take for women to enter back into the workforce and what it's gonna take for that recovery to happen. And so child care, financial stability, decreasing the wage gap, all of those things. And it's also going to, uh, uh, researchers are trying to understand how this will affect, um, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's specifically abortion rate, um, but it's probably a part of the conversation. So uh, a lot of things just build up on each other um, and they're a lot more effective than just saying, don't do it or you'll go to jail. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about that, except, um, you know, back when my mom got pregnant, she told her story, there was no option except, you know, you're going to have the baby and you're going to put it for adoption. And now it's the stigma of being an unwed mother is just, it's just so low that that more people might actually keep their babies instead of feeling like they had to abort or, or put it out for adoption. So um, you're right, there's an accumulative effect that probably would lead to that graph going down. Joan, did you have another comment? Um, well, I was just gonna say, according to figures from the World Health Organization, on average, there's 73.3 million abortions performed every year over the around the world. Mm. So that, narrows down to 139 per minute. Ooh. And then the other thing is the abortion laws in the West, including the United States, are among the most radical in the world. We're alongside China, Vietnam, and North Korea. So, and I don't know where that uh, fact came from. Sorry, I don't have the source of that. Yeah, I'm curious what, what the word radical means. Because that's, anyway, yeah. I'm not sure what radical means. Yeah, there's definitely places around the world that um, where abortion is um, because of the way their their society and government and and um, infrastructure is set up that um, abortion has needed to be used as kind of like a like a lifeline for women um especially in poor or poorer countries where you know women like there's where where 
honor rapes are commonly practiced, um, general mutil genital mutilization, um, mutilation, <laughs> thanks. Genital mutilation, um, and uh, like the nearest clinic or hospital is like miles and miles away and not a lot of vehicles and things like that. So um, uh, what are they called? People who help people. <laughs> Not, not, not necessarily missionaries, but like people. Oh, like aid workers? Aid like, workers. Aid workers. Go okay. into these countries. NGOs. And while, while trying to set up uh, programs and things to help women um, get pregnant less, um, because there's also uh, a culture aspect where women are just seen as like baby machines. Right. And, and even if, you know, their health is declining. They just got to push out these babies and these, these women with like 12 kids and no income. Um, so, so while they're trying to cre uh, create programs to kind of address these different aspects, um, uh, abortion is kind of the immediate uh, lifeline um, while they set up those things. Um, what? Oh. Um, so that definitely contributes to high numbers as well, um, because there are there are places around the world that right now need some sort of way to manage uh, save issues. these women from intense poverty and yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, Carol. In China, that you could abort the girls and keep the boys. Couples could only have one child. Child, and they most of them wanted boys, and they aborted all kinds of little girl babies. Yeah. If that's still on or not? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that's with the, the current. Go ahead, John. You might know. Little... Well, but they're finding out now that they don't have enough young people to support the older people because oh. so many babies were aborted, aborted, and now I think they changed policy that they can have two children now yep. instead of that's just one. one. Yep. Because. They depleted their supply of workers to, mm. you know, to support. So when you use abortion as birth control, it has side effects that Big time. Uh, they, they didn't think about. I think that's, that's, the, that's the other extreme of where you can go when you take away a woman's choice. Um, yeah, anytime you take away a woman or uh, or a family's choice to have a child or not to have a child, there's going to be detrimental um, uh, repercussions. Yeah. yeah. David, David, David first and then Lonnie? Yeah, go ahead, David. Oh, yeah, I was basically going to echo what Sierra said, but just like as a perspective from uh, just like myself and like people that I know who identify as pro-choice, like I've had many conversations about like specifically the like one China po one what is it one child yeah. policy in China now the two child policy and like like every like I've never met someone who says like oh yeah that's a good policy like I'm, like literally everyone I know who identifies as pro choice would say like that's a terrible system because it is like it's not pro choice it's mm -hmm, government right. mandates abortions yeah there's no way around it you're gonna it's, it is a crime to not have an abortion in cases. So like, like, yeah, I would just put it out to like totally agree that like, just because I am, I would not call myself like on the pro-life side of it. Um, like, yeah, I'm not the pro-abortion side either. Like that's right. like, no, I, <laughs> I, there's no world in which I would want that, that, uh, that China policy for, for anyone. Yeah. Great, thank you, David. That was good. Um, Lonnie, did you want to say something, and then we'll yeah um, talk uh, about wrapping up. Okay, uh, yeah, just in the same vein that um, Sierra was talking about these these other countries with some of their really archaic thinking, um, and the fact that the women are are at such a disadvantage, and you know, there's only so much um, private organizations can do. So at some point, 
then do we see that the government does have a responsibility to provide services that are going to educate the women and, and lift them out of the poverty that they're in and, and alter, their, alter their life mm -hmm. options so that they don't have to face an abortion choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, earlier said that, you know, the government has no place in this uh, conversation um, as far as telling a woman what she can and cannot do, or, or not even just women, but telling the public what they can and cannot do with their health. Um, I think our, our government has a responsibility to our underserved communities um, in just this area for education, for um, pr to provide opportunities that they that they're not getting now, so that they can avoid, so they don't, so they're not forced to have to have to find themselves in these positions. Now, you know, I mean, our government doesn't tell us we can have two and a half children. Um, but, um, you know, is the government at a risk then if they provide these kinds of, let's say they provide programs through the Department of Health, are they at a risk then of being um, 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 oh, what is the word, um, supporting, uh, being interpreted as supporting abortion or supporting pro-choice or um, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I just wonder if that, if that is playing a role in a lot of um, maybe politicians treading mm -hmm. uh, this abortion issue very, very gingerly. Um, I, I, I agree with, I agree with Sierra as far as, um, women being um being lifted up they they need they I need that i think it's definitely fail. I, no i was just gonna say they definitely need it because they've been so uh suppressed for so mm -hmm. long and especially in these other countries um anyway i just yeah there's a really good thought. government I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, there was, my sound is like cutting out. So I thought it was like a long pause. So I was oh, like, okay. Oh, but it's like she wasn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to say something, Sarah? I wanted to respond and say, I think it's definitely fair to expect any government to, um, cause it's, it's this, um, push and pull between positive freedoms and negative freedoms. Like the, the freedom to say, no, here are my boundaries. This is how I want to live my life and positive freedoms being uh, having the freedom to pursue what you want to pursue um, as opposed to having external things put placed on you. So I think, you know, especially the, uh, our like our American uh, ideas of freedom, we definitely uh, we start there with the, the, the freedom to just say here are here's my place, my home, my my boundaries. Um, but we're also in pursuit of a world where we want we, we want these other options to say yes and no to all of these other things. Um, so I think what what Carol was saying and what what Lonnie was saying work together where it's like, yeah, we don't want the government to say you have to do this or you can't do that. We want the government to create systems and and spaces where we all get to move about and, and choose the things that we believe are best for us, um, which will include quality healthcare, quality education, housing, you know, all those dirty Marxist things. I vote for, I vote for Sierra. <laughs> when, she, when she runs for office, I'll vote for her. Awesome. I, don't, I don't want all my dirty things to come out. There's right? too many things. <laughs> Jimmy Skelton. Right. Uh, well, I I just I really appreciate the dialogue and all the different 
um, thoughts and questions. Do you all feel like we've had a good conversation about this and you've got information you can go on and we'll move on to something different? Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs up, yeah. Well, um, next week we'll be off. And so I will send you a list of what we have discussed, what we said we wanted to discuss, and then we'll get together and discuss what we want to discuss. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a discussion about that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, in our next group. So two weeks from today, we'll get back together. Um, we'll take input. We've already had a couple of people make some suggestions about getting back into the harmony of the gospels and different things. So um, we've done topical for almost a year. Mm -hmm. So we might, maybe it's time to get back into a book of the Bible or something, but it's been great. And there's no other group of people I would love to go through difficult, challenging topics like this than you guys, because you're gracious and educated and you have opinions and yet um, are willing to listen love and learn it. and love share. So I love it. I love it a lot. So thank you. This is everything I've always wanted discussion group to be. So um, who would like to close this out in prayer and uh, for a two week break, a one week, well, two week break, we'll be back the first week in May, the first Wednesday in May. Fifth. So it'd be May 5th. May 5th. Okay. Anybody want to pray us out? Just pray. I will. Thank you, Lonnie. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your grace upon all of us that we could collectively come together and discuss such a, such a difficult, um, sensitive topic as, as abortion. We're, we want to live in your will, Father, and we are all navigating as best we know how. And we look to each other for support and encouragement without judgment. And we get that from our little cornerstone here. So Father, I ask you to continue blessing Cornerstone and all of the members of the church near and far and keep us all tied together as a family so that we know when the world gets hard out there, we can come back to this group and say, please help me, please be there for me. And we will know that 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 these are the people who will be there for us without judgment. So Father, I thank you for the conversations. I thank you for blessing all of us with your grace and mercy and give us some, um, continue to, continue to uh, shine your grace upon us. In Jesus name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Beautiful, Lonnie. Thank you. How is this beautiful to wrap it up? You're well, welcome. I wish you all a good evening. I'll go ahead and stop recording and feel free to stay on if you want to. Um,